Welcome to Luca Barbato. He will speak to us about the web of things and Rust. So welcome, Luca. Hi, everybody. I can hear that you can hear me. So I will just wait to see if you can also see my presentation. And I guess we can start. So, hi everybody. I'm Luca Barbato. I'm quite involved in open source. And in the past year, I'm involved also in CFIS Home. And we are trying to prove that connected homes could not kill you or snitch on you or worse. So in this presentation, we will talk about connected things, open standards, and how to implement them in Rust. First, what is a connected home? Well, the famous internal things apply to your home. Probably you already have something. Voice agents, so Siri, Google, Alexa, those are one of the cornerstone. Connected ovens or any kind of connected appliance. Some do, some don't. They are fairly good. Smart TV, probably all of you. Smart locks, hopefully none of you. Smart doorbells, again, they are not that common, at least in Europe, in the US a bit more. All those devices are internet of things, connected things, that should do something for your home. Why people like connected homes? There is lots of potential. Can make your life more comfortable. The connected oven can be controlled when you are doing your last ditch grocery run. Can be more efficient. A connected house could not waste energy uh, when nobody is in, in the house. So heating and cooling could be as efficient as possible and as nice as possible. Is it winter? The connected house sees that you are reaching home and start eating before you even get close to the house. So by the time you step in, everything is warm and nice. Same thing in the wind, in summer. More safe. A connected home, a properly connected home, is able to prevent a number of problem issues and hazards. The connected home could uh, discover that there are problems and notify you even if you are not in the home, or notify somebody else if you have something happening in your house without having. Uh, well, the nosy neighbor to do the same thing. So all of it is good. All of it is great. Are we already there? No. We have problems. First, the current solution available are sort of wall gardens. You can get something from that specific provider and that something is not going to talk with the rest of the house sort of defeating the purpose of having something connected. You will have lots and lots of apps on your phone for each of the devices, and the whole thing can be a bit unnerving. Can be a bit more dangerous because most of the, the solution are very close, fairly, uh, well, fairly rough. So the connected oven is supposed to be great, but what happens if the connected oven starts at 3 a.m. because you forgot your phone unlocked? You might have problems. Last but not least, a house in itself does already have some point of failures. The current solution for the connected home add additional point of failures. 
most of the solution that currently we have do have problems because they rely way too much on internet. You use your internet connectivity, your house is that. You can see that with Google Nest, you can see that with other solution, even worse. Who's providing the solution decide to do something else or just disappears? Or your house gets bricked overnight. And then you hope that uh, somebody managed to hack a solution for you. So Home Assistant was great and is still great in uh, solving some of the problem, but is sort of a patch. What we are trying to do in Safe's Home, we want to try to prove at least that you can have a trustworthy connected home quite close to the evil. It is an Horizon 2020 project, so we managed already to convince somebody at the European Commission that our ideas are good. And our focus is on the interoperability part and the security part. We don't want to have single point of failures. We want to uh, use and propose open standards. And we want that the software that is in our house doesn't suck because obviously most of the software does have problems. Among our guidelines, we warmly suggest to use Rust. Why Rust? Because Rust is fairly good at most of the thing that we care about. Rust does prevent most of the memory fault that plug this uh, area of, of development. And if you think that the software bug in your browser is bad, think what happens when there is a bug in your home. Very cold winter in the night. Oops. Your rating system managed to lose the connectivity and doesn't trigger. It happened. A very hot summer day. Same thing. The system relies on the internet. Internet doesn't work, or the system just had a bad bug. Everything doesn't stop working. And usually the current system do not have a manual override. So you are pretty much on your own. The connected oven, it overshoots. It starts when you are not there and to stop it. Goodbye kitchen. or if your smart lock is too friendly, somebody could enter and take whatever it wants, or you can picture the whole thing. Part of what we do in CFS Home is about proving, but we want to use something that is close to reality. So we want to prove that you can do stuff with open standard, the current open standards, and we choose web of things. Why that? Because it's made from the root receipt. So if they manage to have a good success with the browser and all the mess that is around, HTML, CSS, and the rest, probably they can rein in the current messy situation with the connected stuff. We want to do something specific with CFIS Home. We try to make so that the whole system is well integrated and is aware of the all the are that are possible in itself. So every device has to, in a way or another, report which are the risks that can cause. And the whole system has to be aware of the state of all of them and possibly prevent some other situation from happening. Web of Things is all about having connected stuff self-described. So you have something that is Web of Things compli uh, compliant, the thing is able to describe itself. So it is a perfect fit. And another problem that we have is how to deal with a system that is really uh, dynamic. Since what we do in CFIS Home is try 
to get all the single point of failure removed or at least mitigated. One of the part is, okay, the system is fully dynamic. The, the system is fully distributed. The system doesn't rely on internet. That means that the whole system is a small network that should be self-healing. And in order to do that, we have to assume that everything could happen quite dynamically. The Web of Things discovery system is a fairly good fit for us because it solved this problem, figuring out where all the things connected or not happen to be. So for CFISOM, Web of Things is great. Something to see about Web of Things. The first part is we have things. A thing is uh, any kind of devices that uh, is reporting itself. It could be a real device, a virtual device, an aggregate of all the devices. You can have a thing that is the room, and inside the room you have additional things. And then you can control the room, and then the room could control the other things inside the room. So you can play with all the concepts quite well. And under the hood, the whole thing is based on JSON-LP. So you can grok on it. You can deal with it by just being able to serialize and deserialize JSON. You can do something better. Uh, in the end, the, the whole system, the whole specification is fairly straightforward, quite large because uh, you have to take all the, com the whole complexity, but uh, the cost of itself is straightforward. So I don't know if you can see uh, this slide. Probably is a bit uh, too small. Please tell me if you can talk. But the whole concept is you are able to uh, describe every connected devices through a uh, simple JSON, and the whole system is well structured. So just by being able to consume it, you are able to control it. This is the key part of the, the whole Web of Things stuff. The part about discovery, the other part that we like a lot in CFIS. So it's based on MDNS that pretty much everybody knows nowadays. It does the service discovery and then it covers the other half. That is, okay, you know what's the current state. You have to tell people, tell the user what to do with it. So one part is discovering, the other part is storing the whole discovery in some kind of directory. And the directory itself is exposed as a thing. So in Web of Things, everything is a thing, even the part that discover where the things are. Probably it's a bit redundant now. So what we did, we like the concept. Uh, we were lucky since WebThings uh, already had an implementation in Rust. Uh, we do all the experimenting and then we decide to go and write our own. Why? Uh, sometimes the wheel is round enough, sometimes it's square, sometimes it's not complete. This is the latter case. WebThings Rust is covering only the Serbian part, as in the part that is taking care of uh, exposing things, but not the part that is consuming it. So that part is, is incomplete. The other part is what things Rust is just taking in straight JSON. So you write your JSON bits, validates it, and then uh, serve the whole thing. So it's not doing uh, as much as it could to uh, leverage the language. Rust is quite good because the type system 
is able to uh, make a number of checks at compile time, and then you get something that you are fairly sure that works. That is true when you uh, consider the validity of your code. And we tried our best to do the same to make sure that what we want to assemble and serve is validated at compile time as much as possible. Uh, last but not least, we think RAS is using Arctic Web, that is great, does scale a lot, but is fairly large considering other solution. We went with Axum because uh, it cut by half our uh, build time. So this is what we currently have. We try to split all the single concern in multiple crates. So you can reuse all the bits in your project without having to take care of the whole thing. So what to do is only about serializing and deserializing the thing descriptions, since uh, we consider that uh, of key importance for us. And hopefully, we will get to uh, have other parties to use just that, because we solve just a little problem that is making description that are valid and are validated at compile time, and at the same time, consume description and get back something that is structured. So again, we are all, all about getting something that is pre-validated and uh, validated as strictly as possible or as strictly as needed because all about surface is making so that everything is safer. All the concern about building and running servants went in what serve. And as I said, currently we are using Axum and we are trying to make the whole experience as straightforward and streamlined as possible. Last but not least, the part about discovery is in what discovery and we take care of all those details in that part. And this is our current solution for Web of Things in Rust. So some details, the meat of this whole presentation, hopefully. We have uh, the thing description. I say the thing description is normally some kind of JSON. In Rust, we have said that, that deals with serialization and deserialization quite well. So we naturally use it. I say we want to have all the checks or most of the checks, since uh, the word is not perfect, happen at compile, or compile time. And we want to make so that uh, when you're using our crate, uh, the whole experience is not too bad. So this part is an example of building a thing. This is uh, a bigger detail, so you can see. So when you are building a thing, what you do is simply assembling little by little using this builder every bit. And uh, we try to document all the different elements that you can fit in as much as possible. So if you are using Rust Analyzer, the whole experience, even if you are not 100% experienced in writing things, uh, should be straightforward enough. The whole thing is also extensible. Why that? Because the thing description is based on JSON LD and the whole system is made so that you can extend the description and add additional element, extend the vocabulary using additional ontologies. And by doing that, you can add additional semantic content, that is what we care about in CFIS. So for each property, for each action, and for each event, you expose 
in the thing in see if we, we can pin the specific hazard that that action could uh, lead to. So if you have a lamp and you turn it on, you're going to consume energy and depending on the lamp, you might risk to have it, uh, well, overeat and then start a fire. So you can pin a fire hazard there. Uh, how to do that in a structured way? How to do that uh, using Rust? Since uh, if you want to extend structure and do something highly dynamic, uh, JavaScript and TypeScript probably are more straightforward. Some people tried, some people decide that uh, it was a bit complicated. That part uh, tells you that it's not really as simple as telling it. So what we did is we have server that has flattened that let us uh, merge different structure in our serialization. So the key concept is we have our structure that is uh, describing the whole thing. And we are using the generics to uh, append other stuff. So this is the one part of the solution. And since every uh, term in the vocabulary could be extended, we have to have other field for each element of the standard vocabulary. And we keep going down, down, down till the leaf. So in Web of Things, we are, you have the concept of things. You have the concept of what you can do with a thing that is an interaction affordance. You have three kind of interaction affordance that could be a property. So you get or set the state an action that is you tell the thing to do something as complex as you like, and then the thing is going to tell you back if everything went okay or not. And another key part is the data schema that is uh, a way to express the data type that you're dealing with when you are interacting with the thing. Those are pretty much the uh, interesting part coding-wise in the thing description. And they can be fairly complex since the data type that you can use can be pretty much any, anything. So you have to deal with uh, loss of complexity. Uh, this is for you if you are trying to look at it a little bit more. So the key part is we flatten the other field we use generics and uh, we forward all the thing, all the others uh, across the whole structure. Uh, how to deal with uh, all of this? If you were to use uh, the generics as they are, you would have lots and lots and lots of generics. So a thing has to keep the other for the interaction affordance and the other for the data schema. And if you think about the data schema, you might have different flavor of the data schema. And for each of them, you might want to put additional terms in the, the whole vocabulary. So to deal with all this complexity, our solution had been, OK, we keep a single generic and we use associated type to keep the whole thing tidy. And it did work fairly well. So you can build an extension by implementing this right. And all we need is something that can be uh, serialized or in the serialized because everything is based on Serda under the hood. This is uh, for you on the back so you can see it. So the key part is we want something that you can fit serve that to. And those are all the elements in the base thing. 
So you have the generic interaction affordance. You have the specific kind of affordance. So you can add specific term for each of them. You have the concept of form, that is uh, how to actually interact. So which are the roots? Expected response is what you are expecting back. The data schema is uh, what you use to uh, describe all the possible data that you are going to exchange. Object schema and array schema, flavors of the data schema, pretty much. Those three and those four are in a uh, inheritance relationship of some kind. So how to compose the whole thing? Because uh, you can have multiple extensions. So if you want to compose multiple extension, you can go one way, that is you make your own struct and you feed in the struct all the extension you, that you care about and then you use uh, the flatten as we did here. Uh, we provide something that is a little more straightforward, that is, or a little more complex, depending on what you look at, that is using an heterogeneous uh, list. So you can uh, append the different extension and the whole thing in the end get presented as uh, the whole thing. Composing it required to uh, provide an heterogeneous, an heter ooh, heter heterogeneous list and uh, make so that they fit the, the whole uh, extension model. Fairly simple in this part. Uh, the gory details are in the implementation of the list itself, but implementation detail. So what we managed to do is making so that you have an easy way to build your thing, attach as many extensions as you like, and we care about making the whole thing as ergonomic as possible. There are some limitation, but the main idea is that, okay, this is the hard way. The builder has to be generic. You express the generics, you create the builder, and then you go your, your merry way. Or you can do the other way. You start with a builder, and then you attach the different extension one by one. Once you set Phoenix extend, the whole thing is assembled and then you can go and uh, use it. So you have the form and then you extend it, adding the specific additional term for the form and so on and so forth. So hopefully uh, as simple as I'm telling you. And that was the thing description. What we have now is the part about, okay, you managed to uh, do a lot to make so that you can build the description, but you want the thing. You want actually to expose to the world a connected device. So the part about building a servant, it is enough way between a server and a client because in itself, it acts as a server, but uh you could consider it also a client because the interaction goes both ways so what we did we would use what i just presented so what td allows to be extended and we use the extension system to make so that you can build the description and set the roots in in the current case using Axum at the same time. So one of the problem that is you have uh, a sync between the description and the actual capability of the thing are made as unlikely as possible because you are doing the, you're setting both at the same time. So you should be able to avoid mistakes. In this case, what you see is you build the servant calling 
the builder function. And it constructs something that contains already the Serbian extension. This way, you have additional methods like this one, and you have additional methods even when you're setting the form. So this is the form builder exactly as the one in what to do, because it is. And you have additional methods just because you are using something that is containing the server, the Servient extension. So this way, you set the roots when you are building the form. So hopefully, you are not going to make uh, many mistakes. Same thing if you go deep, because the whole system is made so that you can extend every leaf of our big data structure. So this way, you can have a servant that talk HTTP without having to deal with one part making the description, the other part setting all the rules and building on the logic. So how we do that? We are just using exception traits. We have a trait that give you the additional methods and then you implement it on top of the description of the, the whole thing. In this case, our HTTP router is something that we attach on the form builder. And for everybody present, I think the whole thing is simple enough. So that was most of what you have in what serve. Since we cared about the discovery part as well, we integrated also the MDNS part, but that part is uh, fairly straightforward, fairly boring. You just uh, take the same information that you uh, set there and you build also the part that is actually advertising for your thing. So this is what we have in what serve. So what we are doing with CIFIS, we are extending it, it a bit more because everything is a building blocks and everything can be extended. We made all the things so you can build upon us and uh, add additional capabilities without having to touch the layer below. So what you do will get the additional vocabulary that is specific to CFIS, and what serve is going to have an additional API layer since what we are doing with CFIS is a bit more restricted than the whole Web of Things part. In CFIS, we decide to just consider specific kind of uh, devices that you can consider uh, archetypal uh, specific types. So. You have the lamp, you have the oven, you have the fridge, but you don't have something that is uh, outside uh, this stereotype. Last part, uh, what discovery? This part is the one that is currently uh, being developed. Uh, the part about MDNS, again, it was straightforward on one side, is still straightforward on this side. So advertising and getting the advertisement is a solved problem. There is a nice crate that uh, takes care of most of the problems. Uh, it is tiny, uh, probably we will help on the IPv6 part, but just for our purpose, uh, it does work really well. We want to complete the directory part and that part gets uh, fairly annoying because in what discovery you want to be able to issue queries on the directory and get some structured response. And that means that the current specification gives you the option to have JSON path, XPath, and Sparkle. Uh, JSON path is a solved problem, or mostly a solved problem. We have good implementation. Uh, 
already, so we can just use it. Uh, actually, we have to pick the one that we like best because there are many. Uh, for Sparkle, we have a very promising implementation and just one. So the problem is not choosing, but the problem is uh, using it and help them since uh, Sparkle is quite rich, it's quite complicated, and the people at Oxygraph are using RocksDB as backend and the whole thing in itself as its share of problems. Uh, if you can know alternatives about RocksDB or something that is a completely different uh, storage that Oxygraph can easily use, probably they will be grateful. And I'm all yours as well because that part of the that backend is currently one of the pain points. So this is what currently have, and we have. The WTD, we are keep uh, working on it. We are keep updating it. Today I made the 0 0.2 release. So if people want to play with it, can. Uh, we might try to extend it to deal with another Web of Things concept, that is the Think models. We will see how it goes. What serve, uh, we might add additional building blocks. So if you use what profiles, you have something even more pre-made and we try to cover more common patterns. So less code on your own and more code on our side. What discovery? We want to complete the search functionality. Possible new crate, what consume? It's going to reduce the boilerplate that you need when you are using the thing. Think about something that sits on top request. And that's it. If you have a question, I'm over yours. So thank you very much. There are any questions? Yeah, a lot. So let's talk. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, have you been involved with the Meta standard for smart home devices? And what's your view of that? Uh, the problem that I have with Meta is that uh, it was hard to get involved, mainly because the the whole development was a bit behind closed doors. So, and when the the project started, Web of Things was uh, real easy to access and easy to play with, where Matter wasn't really existing. So, I'm fairly curious to see uh, now how it. Uh, turns out, but uh, for the research part, uh, Web of Things uh, was pretty much a no-brainer. We had uh, a large community that we can interact with without many concern. We have good implementation already available. So Web Things uh, solve most of the problems, uh, get you something that you can use from now, uh, the problem that we had is that we had specific needs that require us to uh, go fairly farther from uh, their implementation. But I'm not excluding that we will keep contributing also to web things as well, since that how the whole thing started. Uh, for matter, uh, I'd love to have uh, open specification for the whole thing and hopefully they will appear. And after that, I can have a better idea of uh, what they are offering. But my experience is that, okay, uh, the grandfather and mother had uh, its share of problems. So I'm cautiously optimist that uh, the whole thing uh, is going to take off and not crush and burn as the previous one. But we will see. If the whole thing uh, happens to work, happen to fit uh, our needs, it's not excluded that we will try to uh, apply the same concept that we are applying currently on Web of Things, also on Matter. But, uh, as it is now, it, it is interesting, it is very promising, but 
I'm pretty much on the wait and see uh, situation. Thank you. Here is another question. Yeah, um, I do have two questions which are kind of related. Um, the first one is about the transport, um, especially like the security of the transport. Like, um, is there like TLS involved in any of these? Like, it's it's a web protocol. So moving on, I guess so there's going to be TLS even more in many places. And there is like things related to key rotation and stuff like that. And the second question is related. It's about the authentication part. Um, do you like those devices, they do need to authenticate to each other. Uh, and how is the key management done on that side? Thanks. So the two interesting questions. So the first one uh, is very straightforward. Uh, Web of Things is uh, extra flexible. So you can use any kind of uh, security model that you like. The current specification tells you that you can use or out. So you can go as crazy as you like, MB standard, implementing your OAuth uh, model, whichever you like. The transport, again, the, the whole system is agnostic to the transport. So the current specification gives you different protocols that you can use. HTTP is the one that is the most developed and is the one that we uh, support. but if you want to use MQTT, you can do that. We exclude MQTT from CFIS because MQTT has a single point of failure that is the broker. And uh, extending MQTT uh, to work in a multi-broker context felt uh, fairly problematic. Uh, you have co-op that uh, does exist does solve most of the problem that you mentioned in a very uh, nice way. Uh, the problem that I'm seeing with co-op is only that it doesn't have uh, as much traction as other solution. But if you care about those problems, uh, I suggest you to look at the IATF specification for ACE, or score, and group of score. All of this, uh, if it's implemented properly is going to solve all the problems in the uh, possibly most elegant way, at least in my opinion, from what I've read. But as I said, uh, that part needs uh, more push, more help, and more hands writing code. But this is an option. Uh, as it is, as I told you, the thing description can be extended, so you can put a vocabulary, an ontology that describes an additional protocol, your own, your specific protocol, and then uh, on one side, uh, great, you manage to get the best solution. On the other, uh, ops, if you don't provide a fallback in the thing description, the consumer of the description is going to tell you, uh, okay, I don't know what to do with it. So that's why the think model and the think profile is important. Since even for HTTP, currently there is a specification that tells you, okay, you have HTTP. You have this very restricted subset of things that you can do, of feature that you can use. You want a bit more, there is an additional profile. For the events, you want to use uh, server-side events. This is the profile. Uh, you don't want to, to support it. OK, you have this callback system that is different. You have uh, other solution that you want. You want to use WebSockets on a different profile. So you can keep all the complexity and all the flexibility at bay using the profiles or if you are dealing with devices that have a strong stereotype, the thing model is going to possibly uh, make so that if you want to have a device of some kind, or if you want to have an application controlling devices of some kind, you can use the, the concept of a strict model to uh, make so that all the flexibility that is allowed 
on Web of Things is moderated by uh, being a bit more strict. And this is another reason why we like a lot Web of Things in CFIS. Thank you very much. Any other question? Yes. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question about the builder pattern. Uh, I saw that um, you've, you, um, you construct all the builder and then the build is fallible, right? Because I saw build.unwrap. Do you think that there are uh, use cases where uh, it's better to uh, fail early when you are constructing your builder and making a build uh, infallible? Uh, the, this is uh, an interesting problem. If you look at uh, the current implementation of what it is about 20K lines of Rust because we had we already tried our best to make so that uh, everything that uh, could fail at compile time, it fails. What remains is something that using the current trust uh, was a way too gory to implement, mainly because you have to validate uh, a lot of little de details. The, if you look at the current implementation, it is already very complex. Uh, we made the choice to have this trade-off. So as much as possible is not uh, fallible because it would not compile otherwise. Uh, all the parts that would require using an additional ton of generics, making the whole uh, thing uh, even more gory and making the errors even more impervious, uh, we decide to uh, pay for the unwrap. Uh, things are going to change since uh, uh, the guts might let us uh, get something better, but this is version 0 0.2. We wanted something that uh, is good enough, not perfect, but good enough. Uh, is not excluded that in the future, in the next version, we will manage to uh, completely make so that all the validation happens at compile time. At the current time, we wanted something that you can use, so we had to take this trade off. If you want to join and help, it's all open source, and uh, we participate to the Oktoberfest. So you are welcome to help. Thank you very much. Is there any other question? On this? Okay, so I think I can thank Luca for his uh, introduction to the web of things. It seems like very cool. Thank you.